My name's Ken. I'm here to talk about... Um, well, I was going to talk about penetration testing, which is what I do. Um, then I thought I wouldn't. I thought what I'd talk about is some of the practical imp implementations of what we do and take you down a bit of a personal rant, if you like. Um, some issues that I've seen, some things that I've found along the way that uh, I've encountered while penetration testing over the last nine years, crikey. Um, has anyone heard of cold boot? Anyone heard of that? If you have the old couple of people have heard of cold boot. Okay, we'll have a little chat about that in a moment. Um, or maybe we won't. A pair of cold boots. I don't know quite what you're going to make of those. Um, we'll come back to cold boot in a bit. Um, the things I want to look at today is I want to look at um, how certain types of encryption have been made a bit of a, a, bit of a hash of, um, where pen testing is going wrong, and where things, I think where people start to get into the mix, where I think people start to cause problems with security. I think we all know that you know, we try and go out there and buy products and buy services to try and make things secure, but then end it, it all comes down to people, doesn't it? So I want to talk about some of the issues we've got with encryption. Um, we see the government being lambasted for another civil servant leaving a laptop in the train or getting drunk on a Friday night and leaving it in a taxi or pinching it maybe. And everyone goes, yeah, encryption's the solution. And do you know what? We see all sorts of organizations rolling out encryption on their, their laptops, their servers, and thinking that solves the problem. And a great example of this was a government department that I do some work with. Um, after one of the recent incidents, said, right, if the laptop's not encrypted, it's not leaving the building. They thought, right, okay, that's fine. It's a really good policy because that'll stop our laptops going anywhere and people leaving them anywhere if they're not encrypted. So what did everyone do? They printed out the materials they needed and took them home and left them on the train. <laughs> so it, it, knee-jerk reactions are really not the solution. Um, and I want to show you some examples of how um, you can get any technology wrong. Encryption is fantastic. There's some great vendors out there, TrueKit, Decrypt, PGP, SafeBoot, loads of them around. They're great products. But if you implement them incorrectly, you can get it really badly wrong. I'm going to talk about the first problem, which is um, the fact that data is often not at rest. We talk about full disk encryption. What do you do when you need the data? You decrypt it, and it's running. And one of the best places we, um, we like is the fact that um, a laptop, a desktop, you spend money on encrypting it, and then people forget to lock the, their uh, workstations. What proportion of workstations when you walk around your office environment are un unlocked? We've got a very simple rule at work. It means that if anyone finds a, a laptop un unlocked or a desktop unlocked, they can send an email to the entire company offering a beer to the person who uh, left their machine unlocked. And uh, we see through on it as well. Tomorrow night, the beers are not on me. Um, other problems you find. So everyone's come across the payment card industry. So we saw TK Maxx getting hacked. Well, that's just because one, one of the ones we knew about. Encryption is great, but not when it's reversible. You know, in the past, organizations stored credit card numbers. They stored your credit card number in the clear. They kept your CV2 number with it. Someone comes along, pinches it. Hey, everyone's credit card gets cloned, don't they? Symmetric encryption is often used. It's reversible. We don't like reversible encryption because it means you can get back the plain text. That's no good. And what about social engineering? That's by far the easiest way to get around encryption. Ring someone up and ask for the password. But you know what? It works. And I'll show you an example of that later. I'll talk about this. this is my gag for the day, making a hash of encryption. Don't you just love that? <laughs> Encrypted data at rest is extremely difficult to recover. And this is what I want to talk about cold boot for briefly. This was a process where some researchers at Princeton realized that if you're going to have decrypted data, therefore the secret key to that encryption application, your secret key has to be held in memory for a period of time. So once you've decrypted your, um, your laptop, the secret key is cached in memory. And some very bright sparks with a lot of time on their hands, quite clearly, realize that those secret keys are actually retained in memory for a period of time. So if you get hold of your laptop that was encrypted, but just powered down, just recently powered down, and um, scrape the state of the memory, the secret keys were going to be in there. We did this live on stage at InfoSec, couple, InfoSec a couple of years back. Because the big problem with that is that the memory degrades very quickly. You've got from seconds to a couple of minutes to recover that, the, scrape the memory, which to be frankly isn't enough time to do anything. What do you do with memory? Stop it degrading? You freeze it. Figure it out. You freeze the spray for cleaning your keyboard. And that um, cools the chips, gives you enough time to actually, um, to actually scrape the memory. The problem is, though, doesn't work for very long unless you're actually following your victim around and steal the laptop just as they power it down. You haven't got a hope. But there's one big problem. The biggest problem with full disk encryption on laptops is that if you leave it in standby mode, which many people do, the secret keys remain in memory. Think about it. When you boot a laptop from standby, does it ask you for your encryption password? No. It asks you for your Windows password. So as I said, a word of advice for you in your group security policies, never ever 
allow standby mode. Okay, you can do it from group policy. Hibernate's fine because it writes the state of the laptop to disk. The standby no mode is an absolute no-no. And there's another one. I don't know if anyone here has in um, implemented Windows integrated logon with their encryption package. That's really cool because you fire it up and it loads the secret keys into memory before you put any passwords in at all. Great. How cool is that? Um, a very large bank I know um, spent a fortune on full disk encryption and then put Windows integrated logon on top of it, which completely destroyed the um, security of the... Um, uh, the encryption package because it loads the keys in as you boot up. Um, I want to talk about the future though because we're, we're relying on some encryption technologies that um, are based on algorithms that are considered secure today. Everyone's con um, heard of DES, Defense Encryption Standard, 56-bit cipher, considered absolutely robust in 1995. But not anymore, yet some technologies are still using that. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Um, we're going to need to uh, do a quick uh, I guess bypass around RFID here, but this is um, Exxon Mobil Speed Pass, and it was a transponder-based technology introduced in 1997, used so you could wave a little tag at the petrol pump and it would bill your account automatically. Very cool bit of kit. You can buy stuff in McDonald's as well in the States, I've discovered. <laughs> um, but again, back to this problem with, they've actually rolled out a technology, 12 years old, and some guys at John Hopkins University thought, hang on a minute, that's using DES. We know DES, that's got some problems with the cipher. And I thought, hang on. So they, they built some optimized technology using FPGAs, field, field programmable gate arrays, and used those to optimize cracking of the encryption cipher, the nicest number of collisions in the cipher, and cracked one of the encryption keys for one of these little tags within 15 minutes. And that was four years ago, guys. They've optimized this far, far this, um, since. The big problem is great, okay, Texas Instruments, whose technology was in place, oh, okay, tell you what, we'll replace them. Six million of them. And all of a sudden, you've got a huge problem. You've got an embedded um, set of equipment, hard to replace, hard to refresh. And if you make it backwards compatible, they're going to crack it again, aren't they? So massive problem there with encryption. Um, but getting a bit faster. Everyone thinks, you know, you massively optimize kit to crack stuff. And you know, the, one of the big problems with um, cracking of encryption um, is that the, t the cost of technology you need is dropping and the speed is increasing. And it's been a commonly misheld belief that you need things like supercomputers and craze to um, crack encryption. Pile of rubbish. Anyone here got a um, PlayStation 3? Anyone got a flat screen monitor? Come on, we've all got one of those, haven't we? Why am I talking about those, about cracking encryption? Well, there's a PlayStation 3. One of the great things it has about it is an incredibly powerful processor on board for doing phenomenal graphics processing. It does high definition gaming. Think of the amount of processing power that's going on for you to pan around in your, in your game. Um, so much so that a number of universities noticed it was so powerful, you could use it for things like black hole and genome modeling. And you can actually buy them bare bones on eBay now. For, you can get packs of 20 board-only PlayStation 3s with the basic Linux operating system, purely there for supercomputer speed cracking. Phenomenally powerful. Um, that is the ASIC, this, um, the application-specific integrated circuit, which sits in the back of a TFT monitor. Um, and some bright spark realized that actually in some configurations, some, some TFTs use ASICs, some use FPGAs, you can actually reprogram the video um, boards of flat screen monitors to do cracking for you. If, again, if you think about a, a plasma screen, if it's upscaling one video mode to another, think about the amount of processing power that's going on in there. And bright spark, what he did is he got a couple of defunct um, TFT screens, reprogrammed the, the, um, the boards, and has now got a website you can upload your encrypted password hashes to, and his monitors will crack them for you. Not his PC, the monitors. Now, think about how many old 15-inch monitors are out there nowadays. No one has those. We want 21s and 24s, haven't we? We've gone past those. You can buy monitors for a tenner on eBay. So think about all that processing power that's cheaply available and easy to use. So all of a sudden, power is everywhere. And make it a little bit more crazy. Some of you might have seen this. Um, a Russian organization... I use that rather loosely. Um, they, they claim to be ethical, a company called Elconsoft now, they've gone commercial now. Um, notice that when you, in all of your PCs, you've got a, a video processing um, board, either a dedicated board for those that are hardcore gamers out there, or something on your chipset. Now think about it. You've got a really powerful um, video processing engine that you're not using all the time. So these guys thought, hang on, what about using that processing to actually do something more useful for us? But even better than that, what about distributing that over all of the um, PCs that have got video chips in the office? So we've done this at our place. We've got fairly high-spec video cards anyway. We've got 45 machines sitting there crunching out about 4 billion password attempts a second. And that's really handy in places like um, MS Cache passwords, which are salted with a username. It makes them very, very difficult to crack 
So you have to pr generate your passwords on the fly. So cracking at 4, times 45, 4 billion times 45 attempts per second makes all those things quite achievable. And some good examples, NTLM, the way you should be storing your passwords, don't use LM please, a good example, regular PC might get 40 million or so um, attempts at a password per second, a fast graphics card, a billion, a PlayStation 3 because of its optimization, potentially 5 billion or more. And if you actually start distributing those, look at the power you've got to start cracking this. Quite scary, isn't it? All of a sudden we're seeing some really novel and exponential routes to start attacking the things that we hold dear. Um, great example here. This is um, a guy called Carsten Noll. He's a college student with too much time in his hands and access to a scanning electron microscope. Um, what this guy did is he cracked the Oyster card. Okay. What he did that was interesting is um, the guys who wrote this, Philips, um, used a closed source cipher called Crypto1. They didn't publish the algorithm. As we all know, a great thing to do with algorithms is publish them for peer review. So everyone goes, oh, do you know, that one's rubbish, or that one's really good, or that could be optimized. These guys kept it secret. Not a good thing to do with that or crypto ciphers. Not with the, um, the guys with such big brains around that actually you know, find it quite interesting to crack these. Now, he couldn't find anything out about, about this cipher. So what he did is got a very, very fine slicing knife and chopped the top of the chip off. Put it in his scanning electron microscope and looked at the gates and worked out the crypto algorithm by looking at the gates on the chip. I told you this guy's got way too much time in his hands. Um, but what he did do is he um, came up with quite a novel approach. The paper was interesting, but the most important bit was he realized logically that crypto was going to be dealt with by a separate part of the chip. So he looked for a part of the chip that was, doing, that was separated and only doing one, one particular function. And that bit was doing the crypto. He found an error with a random number generator and could force the, um, that to produce um, the same number, not random numbers, and therefore could clone, clone the Oyster card. And it works. Okay. You need something like a 30 watt transmitter to do it, and CFL claim to have anti-cloning technologies in place. Um, however, some of their gates are offline, so I don't see quite how that can work um, in real time. But anyway, it's been done. This is very, very similar technology to cracking satellite decoder cards. We used to be able to buy them in the pub from a bloke for a five or back in the early 90s. Exactly the same principle, sliced off the top of the card and looked at it in the microscope. Obviously, way earlier, the gates were much bigger, much more straightforward. Um, but there's one place that this took me that I thought really started fascinating me. Um, biometric passports. Um, I applied for one. My daughter got an e-passport. So I got this passport with an RFID chip. And I thought, well, that looks interesting. Let's have a play. So I got to the um, identity and passport service website. It had a, a question, Q&A. Can my passport chip be read from my pocket in my coat on the tube? Sorry, that's red rag to a bull for someone like me. And there's a couple of very bright guys, a chap called Adam Laurie, um, and a couple of other researchers, who took that on and started looking at it. We'd, we'd had a good crack at it first. Um, but couldn't see a way around the crypto. So they said, no, you can't do it. In order to do this, you need a specialist reader and a code that can only be obtained through the information on the passport itself. Yeah, right. Okay, that specialist reader was 11 quid. You can buy them on eBay. If you um, Google for Tiki Tag or Touch a Tag, you can find them. They'll do the job. That is a, um, a sample US passport when the um, US passport agency publish. So that key to read the passport, actually this long number is the key that will dis um, disclose the data you need. So they say, yes, you can't get to it without the key. Unfortunately, the key that looks really long is actually closely related to your date of birth, your country of birth, and everything else you pretty much get from places like Facebook. Okay, not so much information. The only thing you can't um, find in public sources is a passport number, which is a 10-digit number, so 10 billion combinations. Um, it's been proved that um, you can crack it even at the first pass. You could crack it in under four hours, so if it's in the postal system, very quick crack. That's been optimized. It's working far faster now. Here's the big problem and the point I want to make with all this. They're using triple DES encryption to protect our e-passports. We showed that DES, which was secure when it was first implemented and considered secure until about 10 years ago, was, is totally deprecated now. Triple DES. We're relying on passports with a lifespan of 10 years. They're still being issued now. How long before you think they pay any attention to the fact that they've got us um, put a, a line in the sand with a cipher and are relying on that for another 10 years? We're trusting our security to a cipher that's considered secure today. How long do you give it? Certainly with the acceleration of processing power, it worries me. Anyway, moving on. Social engineering. This is one of the most fun things we do during pen tests. I absolutely love it. Social engineering, I have a definition for you. What is it really? It is lying. It's going in there, a bit of this. And it's great fun. Um, particularly, that's one of my colleagues. We just like going and taking photographs of ourselves, doing things we should, really shouldn't be doing. Um, one of his most favorite disguises is a fluorescent yellow jacket. Why? Makes you invisible. <laughs> Promise you. you. Put on a suit and tie, everyone takes, uh, pays attention to you. Yellow jacket, they just assume you're there to do 
support services, things that make the office tick, the cleaning gangs. Um, you might have seen that soccer um, got a successful conviction not so very long ago on the Semitama Mitsui hack. It's all social engineering. I'll show you a bit more about that in a moment. Um, some examples of my colleagues in the uh, department in a local authority was left there for four hours. No one challenged him. Um, it was actually in uh, social services, so access to all sorts of things. Keys are great as long as you leave the key cupboard locked. Um, that's a server room in an organization I found quite fun. These things are great. Um, patched in network um, ports in cupboards. You just go into the cloakroom. Oh, wow, network port. How handy is that? Tuck yourself away. Uh, do remember to lock your workstation, guys. It's not good. Um, client files left for shredding. That'll be fun, won't they? Um, and there's an airline as well. We did a little while back. That was quite, quite a laugh. Um, actually got into the cockpit. It was only at that point the chief executive of the business started to take, pay attention towards their physical security. Um, who here has um, bins for shredding confidential data in their offices? Yep. Do they have confidential data written on them? <laughs> Are they locked? Okay. Are they chained to the wall? Because the great thing about having confidential data bins is that when you walk into a business, it's like, great, you put your really good stuff there. Thank you very much. Off we go. Um, it makes life so easy. It's, uh, it's even better because you actually separate it out from all the rubbish for us. So we don't have to worry about the, uh, the banana skins and the, um, the, pay, the sandwich wrappers and stuff. It's really handy. Things you need, marigold, absolutely essential. Um, when we do have to get uh, dirty, then you, you have to do the old dumpster diving lark. Um, and again, the sort of stuff you can find is absolutely amazing. Um, did some stuff for a, a broking firm recently. Got um, one of the directors, a credit card number off a credit card slip. Got his pension details, the details of two high court judges, credit card numbers, home addresses, the works. And all you need is a pair of marigolds. So given it makes sense to dispose of confidential waste carefully, and just putting shredders everywhere is not such a good idea, what's your advice? Um, shred it or mix it in with everything else. <laughs> It's hard. It's really hard. You have to think about what process you go through for looking after confidential data. If you put it in a bin marked confidential data, and just go, oh, I wonder what's in there. You lock it. That's a good start. But again, one of the things we do is we often take the bins with us and walk them out the door. You know, we're quite legitimate. You know, people expect you people to walk off site with confidential data bins to shred them. Thank you very much. Cut, cut the tops off and you've got everything you need. Um, but that's one of the problems you've got. They need to be locked down. They need to be secured for something. There needs to be a process for vetting the people who come to remove them as well. Blackmail. This is surprisingly effective. First thing, you've got a laptop. Whenever I'm, um, I hear about a laptop being pinched, I want to hear about what was nicked with the laptop. Why? Because it's in a laptop bag. It's probably got a power supply. It's probably got some more material as well, like a business card. I've got the business card. I've got the mobile phone number, the email address, and the name of the person that was um, owning that laptop. That's probably enough to get me started on some social networking. It won't take me long to find out where you live, because I know the, the place where your company works, company's based. I can probably work out roughly how far away you're going to work from that. So I know your mobile number. I'll call you up. Give me the encryption password to your laptop. I saw your kids on the way to school this morning. What are you going to do? You give them the password, don't you? And all of a sudden, the encryption product you rolled out doesn't look very effective, does it? So think about simple things that get around you know, good technical solutions. Don't leave business cards and simple things like that with a laptop. Don't leave things with a laptop that can make it personal identifiable. The only thing I carry with my laptop is a small neoprene case, nothing else. Maybe that's because I'm paranoid, I don't know. <laughs> um, something I'd like to have played you, but I think is really worth you going and listening to you for yourself. Phone Losers of America. I obviously can't reveal, I can't um, publish the recordings of the real jobs we do uh, over the telephone. But PLA Radio is phenomenal. They do live social engineering for a laugh. And they put the MP3s on the website, and you would be gobsmacked what you can find. Phonelosers.org. Um, there are loads of files on there. One of my favorite ones is PLA Radio 02.mp3. It's eight minutes of joy. Ringing up power companies, getting customers' details, getting their phone numbers, spoofing phone companies, getting other people's numbers. It is genius. Even. Um, DVD rental stores, ring them up and getting the details and uh, contact details of someone you want, to, you want to engineer. Or you just use Facebook. Um, this is one of, another great little tool, fucker. Don't say it when you've had too many drinks. It was released at Black Hat and it's great. And one of the cool things it does is it looks at the metadata stored in, in, uh, in documents. Um, a great example of the metadata stored in documents was the dirty dossier in 2003, which was used to justify us going to war with Iraq. Um, if you actually look, I don't know if you can see it too well that I was there, but somebody left, somebody published it sometime on the 10 Downing Street website, 
and failed to remove the metadata. So the sort of things that um, someone analyzed when they got hold of this document, well, hey, there's CIC, Commanders in Chief. Okay, that's one of the usernames. The website is edited by Foreign Office, Downing Street, and two press officers before it was published. So you could actually see the revision history and the sort of people who are playing around with the dirty dossier before it got released to us. So you had the version that was approved by the Commanders in Chief and the version that got to the public. Any surprise we didn't find any weapons of mass destruction. So that's just a word of advice there. Is, uh, I did the very same thing recently um, using Fokker to actually go and pull down all the documents that were published on the 10 Downing Street website, and they've got the message. There's no metadata. So I did the Cabinet Office our website instead. I pulled off 93 people's um, email addresses just from metadata and documents. You could show revision histories, usernames, internal IP addresses, shares, printers, you name it, all sorts of crazy things you can find just from metadata and documents. PDFs, PowerPoints, Word documents, you name it, you can get metadata out of them. Office 2007 has the ability to remove that for you. It can strip the metadata before you publish a document. Just as simple as um, leaving track changes on. Let's go and see who, the last, who, who edited the document on the way through. Um, scamming. This is um, one of the ways to play with social engineering. Um, a recent job we did, uh, with the client's agreement, we set up a fake website. It was the same URL as their, their corporate website, but with one letter changed. It was an H for a B, I think. So it looked, at a glance, it looked straightforward. So we sent them an email address, and we mined it using Google. Very easy. You just use a Google search for at company name .co.uk. You'd be absolutely amazed how many hits you get. Try it yourselves. It's Google for it. Best place is Google on Google Groups, at your company name .co.uk. If you get any hits on the website, minus dub, 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 and you'll get a list of email addresses. It's really handy. We wrote a script that does it for you called Googler, and it just strips it out and formats it for you nicely. Um, so we mined the employees' email addresses. We used social networking um, sites to find one of the IT staff's details and forged an email um, from, forging the from field from one of the IT staff to the company um, members saying, we need to go and change your domain creds. Click here, otherwise you'll lose access to um, some of the key systems. And within 24 hours, sorry, 48 hours, 38% of people gave us their domain credentials by clicking links and emails. What was most amusing is the IT department had stats for how many people responded to IT department requests by email. It was 38%. <laughs> so we actually got everybody who would have responded to an email. We know, it's very good advice, is do not ever click a link in an email. It might seem paranoid, but it's so easy to use tools like cross, or attacks like cross-site scripting to hide your attack so it even looks like you're going to the right website. But it still steals your credentials when you go there. Never, ever click links in emails. If you need to um, click a link in an email, type it from scratch in the URL, in the browser bar. At least that way you know it's going to be pretty much safe. The graph is showing the number of people who responded and gave us their domain credentials by hour over a 48-hour period. <laughs> it's great. Loads of really helpful people gave us creds in the first two hours. It's quite scary. You know, domain creds, that's everything, isn't it? Um, social engineering has to be worth it. I mentioned the Sumitama Mitsui hack. Um, I saw a very interesting presentation from uh, Soccer last week which actually told all sorts of useful information about the real case. It was quite fascinating. Actually, Soccer put out some misinformation about the case early on to see if it actually started things moving and get some attention. It actually really worked for them. And one of the things they did is they actually um, put out a false number. They put out the number 220 million pound theft. And every press story that had 220 million, not 229, which is the real number, they could trace back to their leaks. It was great. Um, and these guys were uh, convicted. Um, this guy... Kevin Donahue was a security guard at Sumitomo Mitsui who was um, turned, for want of a better word, um, and had access to all the CCTV, CCTV cameras and um, passes. So these things are great, but if the person who issues them as controls the access is turned, you've got problems. So he turned up all the uh, CCTV cameras, um, sorted out passes, gave himself uh, full admin rights to all the um, rooms in the building. Forgot, unfortunately, that obviously there are CCTV cameras outside the building on the streets. Of course, Soccer got photographs of the guys going in and out. Um, very clever guys. Installed some software keyloggers. Had an expert in swift form completion. But through one tiny error, the transfers were queried and the funds didn't go. It's crazy. And they went to jail for it. Anyway, those guys at Sumitama Mitsui fell foul of the fact that um, there were existing security systems in place. And I want to talk about how you could make it easier how you can make it a great deal easier, how you can go about walking in and out of buildings without having just to worry about anything. Um, 
I'm going to talk about building management systems. Anyone here know what a building management system is? Anyone got one in their office? Good, we have. Cool. A great bit of kit. The idea being that you have centralized controls. So you don't have the windows open at the same time as the AC's on. You don't have the heating on the AC on at the same time. It's a great idea. Really cool. Um, they always used to work on separate networks. They used to be on really old control systems, serial networks. Everyone remember serial? Joys of RS-232, don't you? Just love it. Um, really old protocols. Some of you might even remember Modbus. Really good old school protocol that's being uh, very widely used in utilities, being ported through to IP over Modbus. Um, all sorts of problems associated with that. And all the stuff that used to make the buildings run, the building controls, it was totally se segregated because it was serial. And the IT guys didn't remember what serial was. Said, what was that? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry I did that at university or something. They knew IP, didn't they? So there were the facilities guys with this serial network that no one knew anything about, and the IT guys with this IP network that just did the IP, IT stuff. That was really cool. And a few vendors, um, back in about 2003, started promoting um, IP-based building management. It was really cool. And we started seeing um, things like air conditioners have network interface cards and Ethernet ports. That's quite cool. That gets me interested straight away. Um, the problem is, in order to do any research on this, you need a building with one. It's a bit of expensive research cost, you know. So we needed to do it, find a different way. Had a good look around eBay. Couldn't find any controllers there either. Um, until I found some. But anyway, um, but if you think about it, what sort of things could you do with a building? We talk about hacking. We talk about you know, taking down websites. We talk about DOS. But what about the environment people work in? And this is why I'm interested in this. What if you were to hack a building? What happens if you switch off the AC in the server room? It's bad enough that it goes wrong by itself. What happens if you do it on a hot, sunny day? Pop. Lots of SNMP messages going, I'm hot, so I'm going to switch off. What about if you turn off the office heating in winter? Building temperature goes below 14 degrees centigrade. You have to evacuate for health and safety reasons. That's how it works. Unless you can provide everyone with big Arctic jackets all of a sudden, you've got to evacuate. What about doors? Everyone's got electronic doors. Fire alarm signal, they're interfaced. They, they fail safe. They fail open. So if you have a fire alarm, all the doors unlock. Great, that's really cool. Even fire alarms are migrated to IP. How about if you send the fire alarm code? You send the fire alarm code to the fire alarm, everything goes off, and there's no broken glass to show you what happened. Crazy stuff. Now, this I love. This was uh, not actually IP building management, but it was serial-based communications, the council, on their car park signs, and someone left an FTP interface open. <laughs> so that, was a, that was a Saturday morning when someone got a shut off. Saturday afternoon, someone got a shut off. And then I discovered, through Googling a bit further about building management systems, is the ground power systems for planes at Gatwick you can you throw use building management systems. So when you plug the plane into the stand, it's building management systems that do the control. Ooh, this is getting interesting, isn't it? I, this is my sort of stuff. Um, so I wanted to know if I could play around with it. Um, I wanted to see if there was much we could do with this technology, much we could do to play with it, see if this new migration of a new technology to IP could be messed around. Um, this is how they work. If you've got basic door controllers, some of you might administrate the door controllers, PC and a bunch of serial comes out to your door. With a building management system that's more advanced with Ethernet, it goes PC, you control to a BMS server, runs Ethernet um, IP out to controllers, and then sends switching signals out, plus, uh, plus 5 volts. And that can do all sorts of things from turning on your, your uh, heating, turning on the AC, turning on fans, all sorts of stuff, That's essentially anything. Um, some of them are very simple, bitwise, zero, one, door open, locked. Some are more complicated. So here's a temperature. If the temperature hits a certain value, do something. Um, where can you find them? Well, they're not going to be in your server room, are they? And you find these bits of kit, they're actually all over the place. They're around in patch cupboards, which are typically not as well secured, not particularly well, well locked, next to AC units. Um, so we would have a bit of play. So we are trying to find some. And it took me a long time to find one. I discovered that our accountants have one, one of the very first installs in the country. It's a Mitsubishi G50, um, six years ago. And they use a very um, proprietary protocol using something called MNET. Um, you might even recognize one of these things, the basic control. You probably recognize that bit more than that bit. Um, but that's how it all works, and it controls the AC. Pretty really cool bit of stuff. It's got a nice little um, uh, compiled application you run on your PC, and it makes stuff work. So we've got access to it. We thought we'd have a bit of fun. That's what it looks like. So you can see just about make out. This is taken with a mobile phone camera. These are the um, fans. And that one was the server room. They're all green. So we did a very simple ARP poison. So we poisoned the ARP cache, and everything went wrong. And the server room AC stopped working which is a bit worrying because we are actually in the server room at the time with the client who said, yes, it's fine, you can play around with my BMS system. And everything started alarming. And at that point on, all the air conditioning in the building stopped working through a simple ARP cache poisoning attack. 
so simple. Now, of course, it was quite straightforward. All we had to do was stop the poisoning attack, flush the, um, the cache, and everything started working again. But a, such a most simple attack like that destroyed everything. Um, we then started looking at what might happen if you started looking at the traffic. Rather than just stopping everything working, what actually was sent? And we discovered that the, um, they sent simple XML messages back with information such as my temperature is this, my status is that. And you know what? There was no authentication, no verification. It's change numbers. Sit there and listen and change everything. Hey, tell the air conditioning units it's really cold. They turn off on a hot day. Tell them it's really hot. They pump out the cold air on the coldest day of the year. And all of a sudden, you've got office problems. Things are starting to go wrong. And there's no authentication. Um, Something a bit more advanced. Anyone want to guess where the most, the, the largest IP BMS, BMS installation was in the world? Terminal Five. Certainly was. Good guess. <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably the largest construction project in the world, which would have helped. So um, I thought I'd have a bit of fun there. Um, I did a bit of googling and I found some press releases from one of the vendors, and it said that uh, this company called Trend Controls won the project, and it was 2,000 controllers managed by a trained supervisor. So I had a little bit more of a play and discovered these things. What did they do? They can be monitored and managed from any point on the network. Oh, great. <laughs> and they work with stuff like fans and fire dampers. So, wow, you know, this, is, this is causing trouble. And, of course, energy management was the core. But they do other things as well. And you think about the greenhouse that Terminal 5 is. You know, all sorts of trouble managing, um, managing and controlling temperatures in it. So I managed to Google one of these. And after a little while, I managed to get hold of one. It's one of these puppies. Um, can't tell you how I got it. That's another story. Really, really simple. It's got, on the top, switching circuits, just to go out there. And my favorite bit, the Ethernet port. Oh, joy. Don't you just love it? And also, an RJ11 as well. So, wired it up with a bit of Heath Robinson uh, wiring. Don't use that. And what did we discover? So, this is how you might go about a very basic application air penetration test uh, in a real-world environment. So, the first thing you do is you hook it up to your network, you find it, we do a basic port and service scan. What did we find? Well, had port 21 open for FTP, file transfer, HTTP, port 443, but no service. So connected to it, logged in over port HTTP, unencrypted. Well, the problem with uh, logging unencrypted means that anyone, anywhere on the network who can sniff that traffic can steal your credentials. Never allow login over um, HTTP. Always use SSL. Next thing. So user control and management. So we found we could create a user account on this box without having to authenticate first. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> okay. You have user, user accounts there. You have people there to manage. Administrators are allowed to add accounts, right? Or you apply for an account and you grant it. You don't just let someone create their own account. So we create one called test. So there you go. We logged in. We're totally unauthenticated, we were logged in. This is great. We've got a list of users there. Next thing you might do in an application layer test, you might have a play around with things like injection attacks. You've all heard of SQL injection attacks. They still work. Have one got full um, domain admin yesterday um, through a uh, vulnerable web application through SQL injection. But one that's more, um, more prevalent is probably cross-site scripting. And there you go. This is an embedded operating system with an embedded web server, which is managed, managed to run a cross-site scripting attack. And what you can do with cross-site scripting is essentially pop up all sorts of things. You can steal sessions, steal credentials. An example here, I might send, if I haven't managed to log in using a, uh, my own account, I might have sent an email with a link. We don't click links and emails, do we? <laughs> click the link, log in. It looks like you're logging into the real application, but it's popped up a fake dialogue. Really simple. Next place you might go, authentication. When you're logging in, you at the very least you expect someone to encrypt the authentication using SSL, don't you? Um, we notice when logging in, it uses a really strong encryption mechanism called Base64, which is, I think we all know is reversible like that. Um, as soon as we saw that, we thought, that's really not much encryption. That doesn't look encrypted. That looks encoded. Shoved it into a uh, decoder, and we found it decodes the plain text of the password we created, which was called text. Nice and easy. So you can sniff the passwords and reverse them easily as well. Session hijacking. This is another good application there, is you? Session hijack, you might um, expect when someone logs in, you expect to be granted a session, which is nice and long and random. right? That's what you'd expect. Okay. The problem is with this particular device is that the way it manages sessions is by setting a parameter and upping it by two each time. So you couldn't possibly work out what the next session might be. <laughs> so session hijacking is where you might 
try and guess someone's session, if it's a nice long session ID, like using J session ID or ASP session ID, you'd never guess it. But if it's sequential and it's rated by two each time, you've got a pretty good chance of jumping into someone else's session. Not difficult, hey? Um, it gets worse as well. One of these things, uh, by the way, I have no idea what the live configuration is in Terminal Fire. I genuinely hope it isn't like this. Okay, I really do. I sincerely hope it isn't. Um, it has a bit of a heartbeat going on. It? it has a UDP broadcast on port 57612. Anything up in that high range has got to be interesting. You know, why would someone put it there? Okay, they're trying to hide something, aren't they? Don't try and hide things by putting them at high ports, by the way. It has a heartbeat. And one of the problems we found is within this heartbeat that it's sent out on this high port, there seems to be a memory leak into these UDP packets. It's starting to do some weird things. Um, and what we found is um, broadcast in the UDP packet was actually bits of our password. How crazy is that? So at any point so that you could sniff on the network, you could actually sniff the passwords just from the packet tra traffic. Um, do you remember we had an FTP server there as well? So the next thing you might do is go and log into FTP and you know, see if they've got the guest account open. See if they've got any common admin accounts, admin, password, admin, password, you never know. So we tried the account we created, it worked straight away. Now where um, testing starts getting a bit more interesting, does everyone come across the idea of fuzzing? Okay, great. Well, fuzzing's how a lot of new vulnerabilities are found. That's how um, Microsoft get bombarded with uh, new vul critical vulnerabilities um, because people try fuzzing attacks. And a great way of trying fuzzing, you basically just throw stuff at, at um, a service to see what happens. 1,025 letter Zs. Why? Because it's one more than 1,024, which is a standard buffer size. So here what we're doing, we're trying to send the append command. We're sending the command $p with a size... 65, one more than 64, one more than the buffer length. Let's see what we can do. Size 129, that works. Size, size 257, 513, the service crashes. There's something wrong with FTP. We've fuzzed it, something's gone wrong. Okay. So everything's now failing through a basic FTP fuzzing attack. Really basic stuff. And the cool bit, do you remember that UDP memory leak as well? What it's now doing, it's also broadcasting the, um, the uh, dollar P that we sent it into its memory leak. So anything else in the network that's listening is also now being hit with this same FTP command. So you get a chain reaction of all of these devices falling over like a data chain. It's quite cute. Uh, just by sending dollar P with a certain size. And then this is the oldest school vulnerability in the world. It was used by um, Kevin Mitnick in one of his very first attacks um, at, at uh, university. When you have set a TCP packet ID, you make it random. Otherwise, you can predict it, and you can do injection man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, you always have nice, random packet IDs. What we discovered with this basic embedded web server, it's 573 at that point where we're using it. Where we start, it goes back to 1, the most basic TCP vulnerability in the world. It failed even that. And we didn't spend that much time testing this bit of kit. So what we were trying to conclude from that was that there's all sorts of cool things you can do with building management systems. Um, the controls aren't hard to find. They're in places you wouldn't expect um, IT kits to be, behind locked doors and server rooms. No, they're out in patch panels in places. What could you do? You could crash the control panels. You'd maybe think about Terminal 5 on a hot day, crash the AC. Um, in your office, switch off the AC in your server room so everything goes pop. Turn the cooling on in winter so everything cools down and you evacuate. Or turn the fire alarm off. There's all sorts of crazy things. Testing security isn't just about your IT system. It isn't about the PCs and servers and Windows and Unix devices you have. It's about everything in your environment, everything with an IP address, and even stuff that might not have an IP address is interesting. Um, I strongly recommend, if you do have a building management system in place right now, go and have a little play with it, go and ask some questions about it, and if someone in facilities asks you about connecting up some net thing to your network, I want to ask quite a lot of questions. Um, I've noticed that the vendors of this technology really don't know about security. I've tried speaking to them about it, and they just put you through to engineering departments. Like security. Uh, what? Yeah, what's that about then? Um, those cold boots, by the way, back to where I started. Um, a few thoughts for you just to um, pick up. As we mentioned standby mode, group policy. Please don't use it. Hibernation's fine, of course. Don't use Windows integrated login because it destroys the um, benefits of full disk encryption. You might, you, some of you remember the firewire attack. You can actually connect to the firewire port on the target laptop and use direct memory access to create user accounts on it. Really cool attack. Um, just about the only way to stop that is to disable the firewire driver in standard builds. You can do that. I strongly recommend you do. Keep an eye on cracking speed. You know, we all thought DES was secure 10 years ago, but now it's being deprecated very, very quickly. But if there's one thing I would just like to leave you with, 
just because I've come up with loads of issues and implementation problems, please do not let me stop you implementing encryption and security technologies in your businesses. Just do it with a, a thought to some of the things I've shown you here. Maybe get someone to come along and test it for you, say, actually, do you know what? You've done it the right way. Or actually, do you know what? Here's a really cool way around it. For a very large retail bank had a, about a million pound laptop encryption problem shot to pieces by some stuff that we showed them. They're asking why they didn't engage us earlier on in the project, but that's another story. Um, so I was going to wrap up. The reason why you test is this. Superpowers don't exist. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it, guys. If you've got any questions, please. Do you think that the cloud computing is an open door to cracking? You can rent um, cracking, cloud cracking devices. You can actually hire you know, sort of supercomputing clusters. Um, but you don't need to because you just use it using VGA cards. The problem with cloud computing is that you're putting your trust in everybody else. At least when you had your business, you could pretty much go, well, look, that's pretty much my perimeter apart from the Blackberries, laptops, smartphones, and you know, home computers and that. At least you could pretty much define your perimeter. With cloud computing, you're trusting loads of, of service providers. Where is your data? It's very hard to say, isn't it? Right. SCADA systems, I understand a lot of them are vulnerable. The problem I have is, let's say you update them today. I mean, these systems last for about 30 years. You update them today, and if you've only got now, let's say, a 10-year life, which you were saying for passports and stuff like that, soon it will be about a year's life. What are we going to do about SCADA systems, which are controlling a lot of very important, valuable stuff in this country, like power stations, nuclear, train systems, aircraft landing systems, all a lot. So what are we going to do? And how are we going to, I mean, you've come in from, let's say, a verification and testing point of view, but what are people who are designing the systems, what are they going to do to actually make sure they're actually going to have secure systems? It's funny you raise the topic of SCADA. It's something I speak on quite regularly as well. Um, there are probably two people in the country capable of testing serial-based SCADA, and we have one that works for us. Um, what do you do with SCADA? Um, it's legacy. It's old. Um, what everyone's doing at the moment is migrating it towards IP so that instead of having to have dedicated um, networks to the SCADA endpoints, you can actually do the whole lot over IP. And I think the big issue we're seeing at the moment is everyone's rushing into just putting everything to IP so you can do it over GSM, um, so you can do it over wireless. Um, and that doesn't matter particularly. I mean, it's just a transport mechanism. As long as um, the endpoints are secured and the mechanism is secured using SSL, for example, it's not an issue. But it's, it's the, the big issues come up where you um, translate the, the serial-based um, protocols into serial over IP. Um, so as long as you've got those nailed, you're usually OK. Um, then you've got to worry about physical access to actual the endpoints because they usually happen to be in sort of pumping stations that are unmanned in the middle of nowhere, that sort of thing. That's where the problems pop up. We've been working with a number of vendors to actually help them deal with um, security of the device from first principles. One of my favorite ever jobs was um, working for a very large um, fashion retailer, and they had an automated warehouse, um, just like the one in Monsters, Inc., you know, with the doors. It was just like that. You go and see clothes lying around on rails. And the whole thing was controlled by SCADA. And we connected up. It was a, it was a Siemens controller, very old bit of kit, and I looked at it and thought, you know what? If I press that button, this whole warehouse stops. And you think about the implications of that in business. Exactly the same with production lines. Um, all, you know, cars are produced on, on production lines controlled by SCADA. Pharmaceuticals are made on production lines controlled by SCADA. This technology that is 30 years old and totally vulnerable. Do you find with a lot of work that you are doing more recently that companies have a fair handling on the IT security side and the physical security side is what is, is basically letting them down. We, we, we try and convince organizations to help let us do a social engineering job every time, usually on no win, no fee. The reason being, because we're never going to get in. Um, and it's the, the, the point of uh, success is usually when you've got your hand on one of the servers in the server room. So at that point, all bets are off. I can't think of the last time we didn't succeed in getting into a server room as part of a social engineering job. You're absolutely right. Organizations, they've got firewalls in place, usually pretty robust. Web applications are getting better now. Still not quite as good as they could be. You still get in one time in two nowadays. Um, but physical security is just stuffed. Why? Because there's usually quite a big disconnect between IT security people and IT and facilities people who control reception, gates, doors, that sort of thing. And it's that gap. So I strongly recommend making really good you know, relations. Build, build bridges between yourselves and the facilities because they're the guys who are protecting your physical assets. My appreciation is since uh, sort of middle of last year that companies are actually thinking um, in this physical sense as well as the IT and, and I think coming under the same sort of 
head guy, as it were, or head person. Uh, in the, I, I think um, KPMG comes to mind um, in, in Canary Wharf that they consider um, as the chap that uh, works there. The physical security comes under him as well as, I think, uh, IT security. So it's an amalgamation that's uh, starting to, to happen, I think, for real. Yeah, there, there is no difference. There really is no difference. Same principles apply, I think. Just thinking about uh, developing applications again, do you think there's like a sort of, you know, if you're developing a new application, there's like a sort of decision process you have to go through to decide how, how much you're going to invest in making it secure? Well, the, the, it needs to start with a risk assessment of sorts. So, I mean, the, the most basic risk assessment would be to decide, well, what sort of data are you, are you going to be dealing, on, dealing with it and where is it going to be available from? Then you can start to quantify what the risks are. Now, if you're collecting you know, non-sensitive information about employees that's only accessible from certain people within the network, the risk is quite difficult here for something that's a, an e-trading application that's accessible to everyone in the world. Um, so you, it's got to start with a risk assessment because you don't need as secure an application, arguably, um, for something that's going to be restricted with internal access only. Yeah, spend more on the stuff that's more exposed. Yeah, because I guess people don't really budget for the development of, of the security bit. So yeah, so is that something? Is that something you guys do as a as a company? <laughs> we come last. Oh, one of the things we do is is we try and help organisations design it out before they start. So we um, rather than sort of get to the end of the development project and the security step in and go, let's get it tested, and then we go, well, do you know what? This is a can of worms. You need to go back, and that just delays the project and pisses everyone off. We'd far rather get involved at the very beginning and say, well. This is what the application is going to look like. This is what it's going to do. Well, have you thought about this, this, this? Has your contract developer, have they thought about and showed you how they're going to mitigate these sort of attacks? Have you contracted that? You know, have you specified the OWASP top 10 application vulnerabilities as you know, the, your application will not be vulnerable to this? So if it does go wrong and the third party does develop poor code, you can say, well, I'm not paying you. Go back, start again. So absolutely, you know, security should be then at the beginning, not bolted on the end like most people do. It costs less that way as well, honestly. Is the OWASP the, the standard to follow then? Open Web Application Security Project, yeah. Um, absolutely. I don't agree with, with their top 10, but it's still, it's still a very good project. What was the biggest unsecured project you've ever worked on? What was their biggest downfalls? Uh, I'll say I can't go into detail, but um, one of the most amusing ones was for a, a, an organisation developing some applications for a, a government department recently. Not the one the ones in the news, but equally sensitive. And um, all of their applications dealing with some very sensitive data were based upon a similar validation process. And we totally bypassed that, which has effectively exposed all sorts of sensitive government information. It was one of those jaw-dropping moments. Even I couldn't quite believe that we'd done it. <laughs> and when you saw the implications of how much was invested in this project and how much was exposed by what we'd achieved, it just made you want to sit back and thought, oh, crikey, I hope everything else isn't like this. But there you go, yes. And how did your company get involved in that? Were you brought in to test it out? Or was it um, in, in government, um, there's a scheme that you might have come across run by GCHQ called Check. Um, and what they, they bring in vetted companies like ourselves to ensure that any data in a protectively marked environment, so secret, is adequately secured. And they specify certain levels of security. And then we go in and blow them apart. I read very recently that... Uh, uh, your password, uh, a password is not secure unless it's at least 14 characters long. Depends in what context. It was to do with laptops. It's, it's a bit of a misnomer. What, uh, the, the reason they, they uh, highlighted 14 was because LM, password hashing, breaks the uh, password down to two seven character segments, which are very easy to crack. If, however, your password is more than 14 characters, it's, by default it's forced into NTLM hashing, which is far, far harder to crack. Um, however, you can, you can set group policy to only store NTLM hashes. So it's a great or more secure. So actually the story was, was slightly misleading. There's nothing wrong with the 14 character password. Please, you know, if you're going to do it, go and do it. Can I just ask, you know, that, um, in your organizations, what's your, your password expiry policy? Is it, is it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Okay. Well, I've, I've, I've got quite a, a different point of view on password expiry. I think that um, having very aggressive password expiry pisses people off and it loses the IT security department friends. Personally, I'd far rather that you work with your people and have a nice long password life, but enforce very strong passwords that people remember and don't write down. Um, also think about password reuse. Why? Because the temptation for people to reuse their domain creds on Facebook is so high. It's ridiculous. It's very difficult to break your domain creds, but if someone's reusing them on Facebook or LinkedIn, which allows you to brute force the password in a way that Facebook doesn't, it's asking for trouble. 
I'd recommend educating your staff. Think about non-alpha numerics. Great character to have in your password is the pound sign. Why? Because all the keyboard, cra all the um, password crackers are coded for US code pages, which don't have the pound sign in. So you can have a one character password as a pound sign, please don't. <laughs> 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 which a password cracker won't crack unless someone set it up and thought about the fact that the pound sign wasn't in there. By the way, if you ever lose your code page, you need to know it's alt 0164. Would that apply for other symbols, such as yen and euro? Yeah, yeah it's relevant as well. Um, but obviously, you know, you've got the euro on your um, keyboard. But, um, I, yeah, as long as it's password, you'll be okay. Can you say something about mobile phones? iPhones aren't suitable for corporate use yet. Uh, the great thing about BlackBerry and Windows Mobile is you can enforce policy remotely using Exchange or the BlackBerry Enterprise server. Really cool. Great risk kit. iPhone, it's not there yet. You can also pinch on iPhone passwords over the air. So you just walk past someone with um, wireless ring on their iPhone, you can get the passwords. Really easy. Um, what sort of vulnerabilities do you see in applications? One of the biggest problems before we start to see polarization of mobile phone operating systems towards um, Apple, Windows Mobile, um, Symbian, everyone used to develop in Java, J2ME, Mobile Edition. And there's a huge problem with client side security with J2ME. Um, some of the banks started rolling out J2ME based mobile applications for banking and you can basically get into them and reverse engineer them and do, pinch people's banking details. There's a lot of J2ME-based um, games, so like you can play poker on your phone, so you know, with various of the, the online betting companies. We pulled some apart and discovered you actually change the incoming card before it got to you. You can play poker or higher or lower and actually get the card you wanted every time. It's quite cute. <laughs> so there's all sorts of problems in all sorts of areas. But it's going to get worse, though, because the more that mobile phone operating systems polarize, the more time hackers will spend on them. Before, when you had one, it, it, every phone had a different OS. There was no point, because by the time you wrote a, a vulnerability for it, the phone was out of date. But now, with Android and all the new app, app, um, operating systems coming out, which are polarized, people will now write issues, vulnerabilities for them. Uh, if we do online shopping, we're always meant to feel very secure when we see the padlock. <laughs> HTTPS yeah. standard. I just wondered if what your comments were. Nothing wrong with, it, with SSL. As long as it's uh, 128 bit or above, nothing wrong with it at all. But the problem is all that's doing is just a transport. That's all it is. It's just encrypting the stuff from your PC to the, the, the server. What it takes no account of is the fact that your machine could be riddled with malware. It's great. You can just sniff it. Thanks. I'll see you encrypting it. So what? I can see it unencrypted on the, um, on the client. There's nothing wrong with SSL. It's fine. You know, there were issues with early versions, but not anymore. Should we be using EVA certificates then? Uh, if you want to give Verisign loads of money, yeah. <laughs> I, have to tell, I don't see any great added value to them. I mean, it's, no, I, I, I don't see. I mean, EVA SSL is great. There's nothing wrong with existing SSL, if you ask me. It's just a question about secure test. Uh, has anybody ever tried to hack into your servers? All the time. Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a point of some, some pride, actually, is um, bring it on. Because you're bound to have rival security companies. They wouldn't bother because we'd just monitor the, we'd monitor the traffic anyway, and if they did that, they'd be reported to GCHQ and they'd be out of business. It, it's all about trust. There are enough bad guy hackers out there for them not to bother. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're being people are having go at us all the time. Um, but that's part of the fun, isn't it? I listened to this program about two or three weeks ago on the BBC, and it was about security. And this person said, in a year's time, you know, you shouldn't be using your PC to buy over the net because it's just going to be so insecure. And how secure do you think the internet is? Is it quite secure? Or? I'd love to know who they interview because I, I, you can almost guarantee it was a security vendor, couldn't you? A bit scaremongering for uncertainty and doubt. Don't you love it? Um, they, they seem to love hyping up the market. Let's say, for example, your Amazon account gets compromised. It's going to happen. What can they do? They're going to ship something to, to you. They need to actually enter the address. So you've got some sort of tracking. So something's placed, you complain to Amazon, they give you your money back, and they probably report the guy to the police. Amazon's not the end of the world. It really isn't. Actually, online banking is pretty robust. I mean, we test for several of the high street retail banks, and we haven't found a way in yet. And there are subtle issues, but we still haven't found a way. I mean, I think it was last time we managed to get a transfer done for slightly more than we should have done. And they thought that was very important. But that we, things are so subtle now. I mean, the, the banks have been going through these processes for years and years and years now. You know, they're used to telephone social engineering. They know the school. It strikes me very forcibly, as being on the periphery of security in my own way, that the biggest problem is compromised clients. In other words, the compromise happens not at the bank's end, but at your end. What have you got to say on that score? Absolutely. I mean, that's where things are. we're starting to see things moving. I've seen some really cute attacks. So you exploit a client's PC. It's got a webcam on it. You install some keyboard, um, keyboard logging. 
Maybe if you're using a token, you can still scrape as long as you've got a certain number of seconds. You've got 30 seconds per token to rotate. Scrape the creds, reuse them. Pray that the bank doesn't allow concurrent session uses of the same session. If they've got a webcam, make sure they're at a PC. And steal the funds while they're at the PC. Okay, call the bank. My account's been raided. Well, hang on a minute. You're at your PC. And look, here's your webcam. Look at it. Shows you're at your PC at the time. It must have been you. So where's, where's, the, where's the crime? It was you. You were just moving funds around, weren't you? No, 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 no. It was a hacker. Yeah, but you're at your PC at the time. And your webcam's got you at the PC at the same time. That's where things are moving. It's all client side. With all the amazing cons you can pull out on ATMs, would you say that internet banking is safer than using an ATM? ATMs are great. Yeah, they're fantastic. It's just, it's just a Windows box with a cut down kernel. That's all. Still got the same vulnerabilities because no one patches them. And we did uh, one a little while back. Um, you basically open up the fantastic. It's a Windows box. Go in there, it's just because it's got a cut down kernel. Everyone assumes you don't need to patch it. We accept they're vulnerable to Sasser, Blaster. But people don't patch them. And all, um, in fact, we did one for a building society. And all their cash machines, their ATMs, are on the same open Class A network as their call center staff. So we um, had a look at it. Um, and all the vendors very helpfully published the APIs. One called Secure Cash Out for Siemens Nixdorf. That was really helpful. Gave us the API we needed to interface with the machine from a call center PC and got cash out of a test machine. That was great fun. But no, they're just PCs. That's all they are. There are engineer codes out there. Um, in fact, one of the biggest problems they have is actually the guys who go and um, load up the, um, the cash is loading the wrong amount of cash into the or long, wrong cash store in the wrong place. So the cash machine thinks it's got 20,000. It's actually got 10,000 in. That's the biggest problem they have. Uh, um, cash machines going down, by the way, is a huge cost to the industry. Um, because if, say, you're a NatWest customer, you go to NatWest ATM and it's out of service for whatever reason, maybe someone's dosed it because it did happen, they go across the road, each transaction costs them a number of pence. It's a huge cost to them if you take the cash machines out for a period of time. Could you tell us something about chip and pin fraud? There's a really good paper done by some guys at Cambridge Uni um, looking at vulnerabilities in chip and pin devices. Um, it's a very interesting area. The, um, it's been shown how easy it is to compromise chip and pin. They haven't actually taken it on directly. They've sort of done, done with sort of relay attacks. So you effectively you relay the number to somebody else. Um, they've also shown that the implementation in UK chip and pin cards is inherently vulnerable. It's worth reading the paper. It, you know, Google it, Cambridge University, chip and pin, you'll find it first hit. Fascinating bit of work they've done. Um, I, I won't steal their thunder because it's great reading. One of the recent, really relatively recent chip and pin things that came to my attention was the compromised chip and pin units that came with um, skimming SMS skimming circuits already built in from China. One of the big high street, high street um, supermarkets, I don't need to name who, um, actually had a case of that. They implemented backdoored chip and pin units. And the only way you could find out easily if they were compromised or not was weighing them. Because the tiny extra bit of circuitry caused the, the backdoor ones to be slightly heavier than the valid ones. And then you might have seen a, uh, a supermarket which had rapidly replaced a number of chip and pin devices. They sort of gaffer taped them um, on instead of the nice holders they had in place. Very quick job done over a weekend. They literally went round and weighed every chip and pin reader they had. And the only way you could tell was because of weight. It's that bad. Cisco had a bunch of their kit backdoored, so manufactured in the Far East, backdoored in the production process. The feeling about the additional authentication when you're buying something online, it's called 3D authentication, I think. Yeah, it's a, it's a good extra level of security. You know, it's another level of authentication, whether it's any good or not, isn't strictly important. It's just it's another layer that makes it harder for, harder for the criminal. You know, it's, your, it's your credit card number, it's your name, it's your, your billing address, your CV2 number, and a password. Great. Yeah, I like it. Just talking about back doors, um, I, I was reading that uh, one of the, I think there's three main contracts that make up the 21st century network that BT are gradually getting there. Um, and one was awarded to a Chinese vendor, I think, which which brought has brought about grave concern whether the, this kit could potentially have back doors. You can't buy networking equipment that's not made in the Far East anymore. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> so. Yeah, you, you, you're stuffed for whichever, whatever you do, aren't you? We spoke a little bit about uh, phones earlier, and you were saying about how what, once you polarise the operating systems, it's worth people attacking. There's another aspect to this, which I, I'm watching really closely, is the headlong rush of mobile operators to, include, to implement app stores. They're tripping over each other to implement these app stores. And contrary to things like a PlayStation, where you've got a big cost for an application, you can justify vast amounts of testing continual regression testing checks for all sorts of things. In the mobile app store world, 
the margin is so slender there, there's no no potential and if you put that in line as well with the pressure to contrary to J2ME which was in a sandbox and it was very careful uh, administration of the, the application life cycle and, and app signing and all that kind of thing now the big pressure you, know, you look at Apple saying uh, every API that's available to an Apple developer will be available to an external developer fantastic Android have said the same with Google and knowing how the attacks have been on mobile operators, I was amazed to see. You can go and look on the Android Project website, and you see some of the change requests that people have got there. How can I interrupt an incoming phone call so that it puts up a nice message ahead of the phone operating? And the Android team on that particular request said, hey, what a neat idea. Yeah, we'll include it in the next release. Now, that's immediately bypassed the whole phone verification process established of 10 years plus in GSM. Sadly, I think it's one of those places that you know, we're going to have to have a shock in. You know, somebody's going to have to go badly wrong for everyone to go, do you know what, that was a really silly idea to do that. I was just wondering if you had any comments on the level of risk when you compared different sizes of organisations, because I can imagine you know, the kind of many of the things that you've done are aimed at big organisations where one department doesn't really know what the other department said and you've got impersonal systems that don't quite work but uh, one part of me thinks that maybe if you're in a small or medium sized business perhaps the risks are different because you know like those social engineering attacks well everyone maybe the building is smaller so they can see the computer room and really people good know each stat other put out by visa a little while back um, and what they did they looked at um, companies that took credit cards so payment card, industry, um, compliant companies. And they classify merchants, the people who take credit cards, into four categories. Level one, so Tesco. Level two, it's all high street fashion retailer, that sort of thing. Level three, a bit smaller. And then level four is everybody else. So the off-license right there, the, the, the corner shop. And their stats showed that 80% of um, credit card activity, fraudulent credit card activity or hacking-related activity, was located in the level four merchants, so people who took less than 20,000 cards per annum. So 80% of the activity was actually focused on the small guys. Why? The big companies have got money to spend on security. Why? Because they've got valuable assets. You know, they've got a reputation to defend. The small companies don't have the resources to do that, so they're easy picking for the hacker. And yet you can still get just as many credit cards out of them. So it's just a different, a, a different type of risk, not a different level of risk. Who do you see as the biggest threat in terms of hacking? Black, is it still, I mean, is it, we're still seeing lots of black hat hackers doing it deliberately to cause trouble, or is it more script kiddies or just people wanting to see if they can get in? Script kiddies deface stuff. They do, they do it for the kicks. They deface it, you put the website back up. It's not often they'll do nasty things. The stuff that you need to be aware of is the people, that, the stuff you don't see. Um, we're involved in stuff. There was a great one recently where a stockbroking firm allowed the PA to one of the directors to work from home. Her son also used the home PC, was looking at some less than salubrious sites and got some malware on the PC. Bright Spark on the other end, who'd seen the compromised malware, exploited it, found out more about the individual, whereas she was the PA to one of the directors and used that privilege to use the VPN to the home PC to get into the corporate network and managed to place trades. And they successfully placed them. It wasn't picked up by there, by the broker's um, fraud detection. It was actually picked up by one of the exchanges. It's just an unusual trading pattern. And yeah, people actually place trades. So the, the problem is, is you don't know what you don't know. Um, the only reason we know about TK Maxx is because the payment card industry said, you've got to tell the press about that. It's happened loads of times before. It's, it's what you don't know. That's the problem. Where do you place windows for warships? Windows for warships? <laughs> <laughs> I hate to tell you this, we're actually working on some of that stuff as well. <laughs> God, that's a, that's a deep question, isn't it? Um, I'm going to answer it in a roundabout way. What, I, what I'd like to say is that um, every time Microsoft released a new operating system, people rush to implement it. I'd say completely opposite. Ask to use XP. There's nothing wrong with Windows XP Service Pack 3. It's a great little operating system. Use what you know, it's stable. Some people still use Windows 98. It's been deprecated for years, it hasn't been patched. Does anyone hack it? No. Everyone's sort of forgotten the vulnerabilities that worked on that until Vista was published and then they had the same vulnerabilities as 98. That's a long story. From what we've done with Windows 7, it looks pretty good. What I would say about Microsoft generally is the number of vulnerabilities that have been found are decreasing, but of, the, of those that are being found, an increasing proportion are critical. If you look at the vulnerabilities released in um, this year, MS09, uh, I think it's seven of the 15 released to date are critical vulnerabilities. 
So I think the lesson is stick to what you know, stick to an operating system that works, hackers ignore it because it's safe, it's robust, people don't focus on it, no one researches it anymore. They want to do the cool stuff, they want to find the vulnerabilities in Windows 7. Okay, so, so following on from that, the, we hear an enormous amount about how organized crime has moved into the hacking arena purely for the profit motive. Does that argument still hold in that context? For profit. It's been going on for long enough in distributed denial service. Um, we do a lot of work in online gambling and gaming. And virtually all of our clients at some point or another have been had a phone call saying, day before the Grand National saying, Go and take your website down. And the website goes down. So, ooh, right, okay, so what did you say again? Um, right, 50,000 quid. And many of them, you know, they paid it. And the next big sporting event, right, half a million. What do you do then? So actually, you phone up someone like, um, oh, I can't remember, Prolexic, and they'll soak the DDoS for you. Um, it's starting to get more intelligent now. They're starting to do things like Sumitama Mitsui by combining attack types, social engineering, um, key logging, a bit of hacking. Do you know what? There were Muppets, the guys who did the Sumitomo Mitsuo hack. They, they just left footprints all over the place and made the hack really messy. Trust me, we could have done a good job there. You know, we're far more profitable than doing pen testing, I'm sure. But um, you just, we look at it and look at the muppetry that was involved. I think if someone who knew what they were doing and thought about you know, the, the trail they were going to leave had done it, someone who understood forensics, I think what they could do. And there are loads of people out there who will do it. It, it. It's what you don't know. That's the problem, guys.